Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order this April 18th, 2024 regular board meeting of the School District of Haverford Township and to welcome everyone, including a lot of folks from Chestnut Walls who have joined us here in the Oakmont Administration Building. The meeting is being broadcast live on the district's YouTube channel and is being recorded for later viewing. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now members of our board will read the district's mission and goals. The mission of the School District of Haverton Township is to educate and to inspire a community of lifelong learners who become well-rounded global citizens. The pillars of our educational system are, our school environment is safe and nurturing, excellence in education is a shared responsibility in partnership with all district and community members, whole child development is vital to our educational system, supports and conditions exist whereby all students have opportunities to grow and excel in the areas of academic technical and career and social emotional learning our decision making process is student centered and student voice is valued the 2025 2020 to 2025 district goals are social and emotional wellness to produce a community of empathetic and resilient learners with skills to socially and emotionally flourish to prepare contemporary citizens modernize and expand learning experiences to prepare students as critical thinkers, problem solvers, innovators, and designers within a global complex society, and diversity and inclusion to establish a culturally diverse and inclusive educational experience that develops socio-cultural proficiency. Thank you. And now I ask our board secretary, Mr. Anthony Testa, to please call the roll. Dr. King? Present. Dr. Larson? Here. Ms. Lee? Dr. McKay? Here. Mr. Schwartz? Here. Dr. Shelton? Here. Ms. Vitale? Here. Ms. Snodgrass? Here. Ms. Wiedemann? Here. Ms. Lee had a work conflict this evening. The next item on our agenda is the minutes. I will welcome the motion to approve the official minutes from the April 4th, 2024 regular board meeting. Person moved. Shelton second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Minutes are approved. The second section of our agenda is for reports from our student representatives. We'll start with the middle school, Haverford Middle School representative, Naomi Ludwig. Good evening, Haverford Board. My name is Naomi Ludwig. And I'm so happy to be joining you all here again tonight to summarize what's been happening at Haverford Middle School. The spring sports season is off and running for example, the girls track and field team had their first away meet of the season last Wednesday at Marple Newtown High School with an overall win. I'm currently running the 4x4 relay, the 800, and the mile with the distance runners. Boys track had a home meet today and girls track had an away meet. Today, girls 7th grade softball, 8th grade softball, 7th and 8th grade baseball, Boys tennis and boys lacrosse also had away games. Soon, we will be recognizing Administrative Professionals Appreciation Week in honor of Miss Sprinkle, Miss Laser, Miss Siancy, and Miss Debella. This week is celebrating the overall support and time these staff members dedicate to their community that does not go unnoticed. Students in sixth through eighth grade will be participating in the PSSAs during the mornings of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of next week. Additionally, next week on Tuesday, there will be no school. Also, May through June, there will be a multitude of exciting events planned. On May 3rd, there will be a Senior Citizens Dance Night, which students from Haverford will be helping with the dance. Following that, on May 8th, there will be a district-wide art show. One of my personal favorites, Potter Cup, will be attended by all grades May 13th during the school day. Later May on the 29th, as well as the 30th, sixth graders will be traveling to Camp Canadensis. Seventh grade will be going to Dorney Park on June 5th, and eighth grade will be going to Hershey Park on June 4th. All the grades will have the comfort of riding to their locations in luxury buses. <laughs> I promise there are only a few dates left 
on May 24th, 7th grade band, 8th grade band, all select chorus groups, 7th and 8th grade orchestra will be going to Washington, D.C. Finally, 8th graders will be ending the year with a dance on June 8th. Thank you so much for letting me speak here tonight. Have a great rest of your evenings. I bet all of the students from Chestnut Walt are even now looking more forward to what goes on at the middle school. Thank you. And from the Haverford High School, our student representative tonight is Erin Coyle. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to present. My name is Erin, and I'm in my final months of being a senior at Haverford High School. And all the exciting end of the year celebrations are approaching as we're in our fourth quarter now. Um, all the school dances are approaching, approaching. Frosh is tomorrow. Junior prom is next Friday, and senior prom is on May 10th. And along with that, Senior Decision Day is coming up at the end of April, where seniors solidify their plans for next year and celebrate all the hard work they put in at Haverford. Haverford is continuing to have opportunities to brace students for their future as they are to come. Um, a job fair was hosted last Thursday in the gym for students who are looking for maybe their first employment over the summer or beyond that. And the high school is also hosting a Delaware County Community College Application Completion Day on Friday, April 26th, to help those with extra guidance with their applications. And the Hartford High School Counseling Department is discussing the common application, Naviance, and other important college events, such as college visits, letters of rec, and the process of requesting transcripts on Tuesday, April 30th from 6 to 7 in the amphitheater at the high school. And after going through the application process this year, I would really recommend it to anyone. It is really complex, more, more work than you actually think, so I really would recommend taking the help. Uh, Fords are working hard in the classroom as they prepare for finals, AP exams, keystones, and any other exams to wrap up the year. AP exams are set to take place from May 6th to May 17th. And Haverford also hosted an in-school SAT last Wednesday, April 10th, where 170 students took the SAT. And this is a really great alternative to like a weekend SAT because weekends can be jam-packed with events, as we all know. Outside of the classroom, Fords are working hard and dominating in all areas. Forge Track Classic, or sorry, Forge Track Classic was the first ever Friday night track meet at HHS, and it took place on Friday, April 12th, with record times and a beautiful double rainbow that came out after the rain. Softball and volleyball are undefeated right now, and baseball and boys lacrosse are also having strong seasons. Girls lacrosse hosted a Morgan's Message Night to raise awareness for mental health among student athletes. And Unified Track is dominating and will host a meet on Wednesday, May 1st. And this week is celebrating PIAA Official Appreciation Week, and captains of each HHS team are giving referees and umpires a thank you letter along with red and gold starbursts. Mm -hmm. Yesterday in medical careers, we took the skills portion of our NACTI exam, which is part of the certification we received following the course that helps us get an entry level position in healthcare. My classmates and I performed very well, and we have our written portion next week, and I'm continuing to prepare for that. And then after our exam, we get to do more specialized content, which I'm really looking forward to because I can really dwell on my interests that I have in medicine. And I'm very excited for what more is to come, and I'm more excited to share with you all the senior activities. We have a lot planned for us, so I'm really excited. So thank you for allowing me to present today, and enjoy the rest of your week. Go Fords. Mm -hmm. All good stuff. Thank you. The next section of our agenda is the superintendent's report, Dr. Lucian. Thank you, Ms. Wiedemann. Uh, this evening. Another exciting portion of our agenda this evening, we have students here from Chestnut Walled Elementary who are going to share with us uh, the focal point of um, a book that they looked at, the author who came to visit, and lots of activities that the students have been engaged in all, th all throughout the year. And was that, Katie, is this the one that was funded through the Ed Foundation? So I'm sure they'll probably mention um, the role that the uh, School District of Haverford Township Ed Foundation had um, in supporting all of these great activities that our students are going to share with us right now. So we'll turn it over to Chestnut Wall. I'm going to work around the stool here for our friends coming up in a little bit. Thank you for having us. Um, as Dr. Rushi said, we're going to talk a lot uh, tonight about our one book, one chestnut wald. So coming in as a new principal in July, I was blown away to know that there was 
a teacher group representing all grade levels, all departments in the building who each year come together to choose a book that will be the will connect all of our work throughout the year. So that was already very exciting for me. And then I learned that they, this year, coming into this year, wanted to add a little bit more to that work. They wanted to include STEM, a STEM component, and they wanted to really focus within our district's strategic goal of diversity and inclusion, specifically targeting that sense of belonging for our students. So, as Dr. Rishi said, they know, knew that that would take a little more financial backing than we typically would budget or that our PTO could give. So they set out to complete the painstaking task of a grant request, um, which we were awarded from the Education Foundation, the Haverford Education Foundation. Some of the requests for that grant were the t-shirts that you see all of our students wearing today. Every student in our building got those t-shirts so that we could have days where everyone feels connected. Um, we also were able to welcome uh, the author of our one book, which was The Big Umbrella, to come to Chestnut World for two days, which also included a community event in the evening on one of those days. So that was very exciting. Um, we incorporated some reading incentives and materials for both Kindness Week and STEM Week. So without further ado, I want to turn that over to show all of this work that we've been doing. I don't have the clicker. It's me. Hold on. There we go. We can go to the video. So this video shows just what we sent out to, we shared with all of our students and sent out to our community at the beginning of the year. Hi, Chesna Wald, this is Mrs. Leach, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the book we're going to be reading this year. So each year, we choose a book with a theme that we can focus on throughout the year. This year, we're embracing the theme, We've Got You Covered, just like my shirt says. Just like the magic of a big umbrella that keeps us all snug and dry. This is a year all about togetherness, belonging, and making sure everyone feels welcome, just like being part of a big, friendly family. Our adventure begins with a special book called The Big Umbrella. Inside its pages, we'll meet all different kinds of characters and see all the things the umbrella can do. Then throughout the year, we'll explore STEM activities, create art that's bursting with creativity, and even make music together. Imagine all the fun we'll have making new friends, working together and discovering amazing things. Just like the fabric of an umbrella, our kindness and friendship weave us together. When we stand as one, we create a shelter that covers everyone. So get ready for a fantastic year ahead where we'll learn, grow and show how much we care for each other. Together with the big umbrella, we've got you covered, just like a cozy umbrella on a rainy day, spreading comfort and joy to all. The Big Umbrella by Amy June Bates, co-written with her daughter, Juniper Bates. By the front door, there is an umbrella. It is big. It is a big, friendly umbrella. It likes to help. It likes to spread its arms wide. It loves to give shelter. It loves to gather people in. It doesn't matter if you are tall or hairy <laughs> or plaid. It doesn't matter how many legs you have. Some people worry that there won't be enough room under the big umbrella. But the amazing thing is there is. <laughs> there is always room. I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Gretchen, who is going to talk a little bit more about how we started our year. So one of my favorite days of the school year up to this point was our um, kickoff assembly that we had in the beginning of the school year. So we held it morning meeting style. So all of the kids in the school came into the gym and we made a big circle. And um, we introduced the theme for the book. We did a greeting. We did an activity together and kids had a chance to share. Um, there's no better way to show a sense of belonging in the community when you're all gathered together in one space. Um, you know, it fits right with our book, but this is a, a piece of our community. We often try to do this type of assembly and it really gives the, the children a chance to feel as though they belong at Chestnut Wild. Um, the components of morning meeting are typically a greeting, a sharing, and an activity. So one of the activities that 
um, one of our kindergarten teachers typically does every year is she gives the kids a ball of yarn and she passes it around to each one of the students. After each child gets it, it forms a big web. They let go of the string and they see how they're an important part. When, when the string gets let go, it, it all gets tangled. So it goes right along with that sense of, you know, we have each other's back. Um, another, another activity, we actually did this at one point with our whole school in our assembly, and we also have done this with the staff, where you sit in a circle and you put one hand over your heart and one hand on each other's back. What another great way to say, we've got you covered, we have your back. Um, so these are all activities that we do throughout the year to build the social and emotional component, and it really does feel it's a sense of belonging and a community within our school. Hi, I'm Christy Marshall, one of the first grade teachers and proud member of the Chestnut Wald community. Thank you for having us. Um, as you can see on the screen there, every class participated in making an umbrella that was unique to its class. So every student was represented on, in some way on the umbrella that is in the main hallway. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, throughout our whole school, there are various um, rainbow colored umbrellas, rainbow, all kinds of, um, Sorry, I'm losing my colorful uh, wall displays, decorate the hallways and the stairwells to remind the students we have them covered no matter what. Okay. Um, there are STEM books and books, the diverse characters. We're going to use some of the money from the grant to continue with inclusive readings and represent all students. And a very special thank you to the Ed Foundation that with their empowerment grant, we were able to buy a t-shirt, not buy, we were able to get a t-shirt for free for each of the students so that all students can participate in the Spirit Day Wear. Thank you. Okay, and as I mentioned before, we were able to welcome our author. So um, Amy June Bates came to Chestnut Wald for two days. For the first day, she did assemblies with all students. In the evening, this was part of um, the Ed Foundation also wanted us to incorporate a community night. So we were excited to do that where we opened that up to all schools in the district. That wasn't just for Chestnut Wald students. And that's something that we're hoping to continue possibly in the future. Um, in the second day that Ms. Bates was there, she actually pulled small groups of students who were interested in doing more work with illustrations. She actually is originally an illustrator um, and then became an author. So uh, we had select students from every class who expressed an interest in wanting to go, were able to go and spend a little bit more time practicing drawing. And this are some pictures from our community event, just to show our, our, all of our students who came and pre-ordered a book were able to get their book signed. Um, and with a fun little picture that she drew for them, they were very excited. So um, we were excited to be able to host that event. I'm gonna turn it over to Mrs. Kunza. Hi, thank you for um, having us here tonight. So for the past six years, Chestnut Wald has participated in the Great Kindness Challenge. This week focuses on kind acts and the importance of participating in those acts in our world, as well as in Chestnut Wald itself. We always include a philanthropic activity, and this activity is for the staff, the students, and their families. This activity provides the students with an opportunity to see that many small acts can combine to make the world a better place. For seminar, one of my students selected to make the community a better place for his passion project. So I wanna introduce De Quincy Coleman McRae, so he can talk about the coin drive that he ran. I wanted to raise money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital because my grandparents always raised money for them. And on Kindness Week, I started a coin drive and the Chestnut family raised over $6,000. I started a shootout competition because I love basketball and I wanted to make Chestnut Wald a better place. So 
how it worked was each class in PE competed, and then we had an assembly for the class winners to be named a grade winner. This event was incredible to watch because we had all the students sitting in the crowd and we, as we called each class winner up, this cheering happened for every single student. And then when they were playing, every shot was screaming and then a, oh, if they missed it, ah, oh, if they made it. I mean, it was truly amazing. It's the first time we did something like this and it was really just incredible. And De Quincey is being pretty modest at this moment. He really organized this entire thing. He was. He went to PE classes and phenomenal. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Munch, and I am one of our two school counselors at Chestnut Wald. And as um, Karen Kunza had previously said, um, Chestnut Wald has been participating in the Great Kindness Challenge since 20, 2018. And at the heart of the Great Kindness Challenge is the idea that kindness strengthens a community and brings people together. And as is the case with any action, with practice and with repetition, a habit can be formed. So to continue to foster kind habits beyond the Kindness Challenge Week, a school-wide initiative called Caught Spreading Sunshine has, has been implemented this year. Students and teachers are encouraged to recognize the kind acts of one another by filling out the Caught Spreading Sunshine slips. And every classroom has these in them, and there's a box. So when a child notices a kind act, they can fill one out and put it in the box. On a biweekly basis, a slip is then pulled from each grade level and the students are recognized with a special afternoon sunshine announcement. It is a joy to hear the cheers erupt from the building as the students' names are announced. The group of recognized students have their picture displayed in the main hallway for all to see and each recognized student receives a caught spreading kindness car magnet that was generously funded by our Chestnut Wild PTO. Those who are not formally recognized though also benefit. All caught spreading sunshine slips are distributed to the students to take home as a reminder of their role in making others days a little brighter. This inclusive activity has become a fast favorite at Chestnut Wald. But don't take my word for that, because tonight we brought along a few of our recognized sunshine spreaders to tell you about their experience when they were caught spreading sunshine. Hi. My name is Wally, and I am in kindergarten. Spring sunshine makes me feel happy because it's fun to be kind. Hi, my name is Asha, and I'm in first grade. Spreading sunshine makes me feel happy because I was helping other people when they dropped their pencils. Helping other people makes them feel better. Hi, my name is Eloise and I am in second grade. I think spreading kindness is important because it makes people feel happy. When people feel happy, they want to do stuff. They want to be social and they want to spread sunshine. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Kobe, and I'm in the third grade. I felt happy when I was caught spreading sunshine because I love helping people. I am called the mayor of Chestnut Wall because I always make sure to say, to say hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. My name is 
Shannon. I am in fourth grade. When I was caught spreading sunshine, it made me feel special because I like helping people and I never knew there was an award for spreading sunshine. And if I knew about it, I would n never have thought it would have been me. Hi, my name is Jacob and I am in fifth grade. I think spreading kindness is important because it makes other people happy when you are kind to them, which might make them want to spread sunshine, which it keeps going and has the positive effect on the whole school. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, students. You did an awesome job. Yes. The efforts and kind acts of our Chestnut Wall community are what allow us to continue to be recognized as a kindness certified school by the nonprofit organization Kids for Peace, which you can see on our um, kindness certified certificate. Okay, and last but not least, you've noticed how there was the theme that everything revolved around the, the umbrella, the weather. Um, so coming up the week of May 20th, we are really excited to welcome volunteers from our parents and community who work in a science, technology, engineering, or math field who will be coming in to speak to all grade levels. Um, and then each grade level on May 24th will complete one of the projects that you see up here. And then we, were, we are also fortunate enough to have some of our high school students come down um, to do some science experiments with our students. So we're very excited about that. Um, as you can tell from the representation up here and the representation in the room, community is important to us. And that is the message that we want to continue spreading. We are so proud of this work and we just wanna thank you for allowing us to share it with you tonight. I'll just say that the uh, you know you have expanded your mission here tonight because I know you spread a lot of joy and happiness to everybody here and who's watching the meeting. I would invite any board members who have questions or comments about the program at Chestnut Wall. So I just have a comment. Um, I might be slightly biased, <laughs> but um, it was a wonderful presentation. As a Chestnut Wall parent, I can tell you that the kindness that is spread is a real thing that many families and students feel and it, it spreads in the neighborhood. So thank you for your kindness and thank you for the presentation tonight. Building on what Dr. King said, um, <laughs> yeah, lots of chestnut world pride in the room tonight. Um, thank you so much. I mean, you can feel this energy, this vibe when you walk into chestnut world and um, you know, as Ms. Wiedemann just mentioned, it's permeated beyond, but to walk into a school and know that you are welcome, you, people have got your back, you are included, um, it's incredible. And I've seen the benefits um, in my own, you know, child who goes to Chestnut Wald, um, in her friends in the neighborhood, it's, it's contagious and it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for all the hard work you and your team put into this. Thank you. Thanks to the students for being here, being here this evening. Um, those of you who are in fifth grade, I'm sure Mr. Haran will be looking for your names as he, <laughs> he has positioned himself by the door, our middle school principal, to get to know some of those, those children coming up. Uh, and thank you to the adults for the time in, into that grant application um, as well, uh, and we go, continuing to go above, above and beyond. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are going to continue. We've had all of the student presentations and highlights. Um, we're going to get into our budget discussion and the rest of the meeting agenda. So if, um, if people want to exit now before <laughs> digging into that, um, I invite you to do so. But thank you for joining us. You're welcome to stay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so as the elementary oriented folks are moving out, if there were people who were waiting in the hallway or on the sides of the room, you can take the many more available seats now here within the meeting room. And Mr. Testa will provide for us uh, an overview of the 24-25 um, budget as it exists today. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Good evening. So this will just be um, another review of the budget that we have seen for the proposed final budget um, with some additional information. So the proposed budget summary that we presented previously showed revenues um, in the line of 150 million with expenditures at 152 million with an, a deficit of 2 million that we would support with um, our unreserved fund balance. Um, the budget as presented uh, has a tax increase of 4%. The Act 1 index allows us to go to 5.3%. Um, and on the right side of the, the middle part of that screen, it shows our current millage at 18.684 with a proposed millage at 4% up to 188951. When we talk about the taxpayer effect, if we look at the average assessed value using a home at 346,000, your taxes at this current year rate is 6,294. And then going into the next fiscal year, they would be 6,546 for a difference of $252 in the tax bill. Um, fund balance, so how we're supporting part of the budget is with the fund balance. Currently we have an $11 million fund balance would bring us down to a little over 9 million, which would leave us with an unreserved fund balance of 5.9%. Um, legally, we can carry up to 8% and still allow us to increase taxes. So it still keeps us within that five to 8% range. When we talk about revenue sources, we have three primary sources, local, state, and federal revenues. Your local revenue is primarily made up of your real estate taxes. Your state revenues are made up of your basic ed funding and your special ed funding. Um, there's also transportation in there and then reimbursements for uh, payroll liabilities that we have for taxes. Um, basic ed funding, essentially in the governor's proposal, what we're getting today is the 2324 basic ed funding. Um, he did add two streams of funding. Um, Haverford will be getting a small portion of um, one of those funds, and we will not get the uh, third one that is listed there, the adequacy investment. As far as how our resources are allocated, so we wanted to break them down into two categories, what's non-discretionary um, committed with contracts and agreements, and then discretionary expenses. So as you can see, a large portion, your salaries and your benefits are what's non-discretionary. They're um, in the agreements that we have with staff. And in your personal professional services, um, we have services to the IU, we have professional educational and legal services as your primary source. In your purchase property services, we have technology leases, we have building and IT maintenance contracts. So when we talk about technology leases, we have laptops, we have different items that are part of our technology infrastructure that we fund. Um, so it would be considered non-discretionary. Your other purchase services, we have tuition to outside schools. So students who need uh, services other than what we are offering in our buildings, um, we do uh, pay for that tuition for those students as well. And even in the supply category at the bottom, um, we have the cost of utilities to run our facilities. As far as equipment, um, we're looking at new fuel pumps for the transportation center. We have security cameras. Uh, we have a software program that we use for our access program in there. Uh, when the bottom section where you look at dues, fees, and debt service. So this is primarily um, close to 100% is made up of the principal and interest that we have out on our debt service. Um, we talked about factors for resource expansion. So you know what changed from last year to this year? Uh, we have 3.3 million for employee contracts and agreements. We have 2.8 million for employee benefits. So that includes all of your prescription, your health, um, your PEASers, your um, FICA that goes against payroll. 
Uh, we have other purchase services. Uh, tuition to approve private schools is included in that category. Um, our DCIU operating expenses. In supplies, uh, we have some money set aside to fund new curriculum. We have mechanical supplies and utilities, again, to help maintain the buildings. And then uh, the bottom section is equipment for maintenance and furniture. We have about 165,000 um, set aside in that expansion. Other items, and we had addressed these in the, in the last meeting, but just wanted to highlight them again. Um, we're looking at different um, staffing for a PATH teacher at the high school, AS teacher at the middle school, supervisor of special programs. Um, then we have some other items that we're utilizing to address um, growth in general education as well. And certainly these are items that we'll continue to look at. Um, some of these items may change. Uh, we may replace them with other items just to see where the most important uh, need is for the funds. What drives our budget is the Act 1 index. So in the state of Pennsylvania, we are tied to the Act 1 index um, that is set each year. Currently this year it's at 5.3%. You can see that in the second to the bottom line in that chart. Um, what this chart shows is over the past years where the index has sat, the millage increase that Haverford has enacted, and then what percentage of that did we use? So you can see um, as we're getting closer to this year, we've utilized, we've tried to use, utilize less of that Act 1 index to help um, ease the burden for the taxes. The actual instructional expense per ADM or at your average daily membership of students, you can see that the, um, how that has plotted out over time. And Act 1 defined, so basically that is driven by the statewide average weekly wage and the Federal Employment Cost Index. So the average of those two is how the state sets that Act 1 index every year for school districts in Pennsylvania. And again, this just gives a, a description of what the statewide average weekly index is, um, tied somewhat to the unemployment compensation law, and then your employment cost index, which is the change in the hourly labor cost to employers over time, um, specific to school districts. So with that Act 1 index, there's also an Act 1 timeline that we have to follow. So school districts have two options. They can adopt to not exceed that index that is set by the state of Pennsylvania, or they can choose to um, seek exceptions. Uh, you, you do have an option to seek an exception for special education costs if they reach a certain level that's exceeding what your district can support. So you either have the option to adopt that or you can accelerate your budget and actually do a preliminary budget in January. Um, so it, what that does is it by taking the opt-out adoption, it actually gives you more time to kind of think about the budget. Um, because you'd, you would really have to start probably in November if you're going to adopt a budget in January. And this, at that point, you've, you've been in school for only a couple months. So this gives you the ability to kind of take a look at the data, um, get some a good handle on the numbers, and really think about what that next fiscal year will look like. Um, so February 1st, uh, if that school district is going to um, adopt a the budget ahead of time, you will um, want to seek those exceptions. That's your deadline on February 1st. Our district is not doing that, so um, we, we will not follow that path. And, and then at the very bottom, just uh, on May 1st, the Department of Ed will notify the district of what uh, property tax reductions they will get through the Homestead Act. So anyone who has applied for the Homestead credit um, will know what that pot of money is that will be allocated back to the taxpayers. And then this is really kind of where we are at this point. So on May 2nd, we will have a proposed final budget adoption um, that will then be available for the public for inspection on the form that is required by PDE. And then on June 3rd, which is 10 days before the June meeting where we would actually approve the final budget adoption, we'll have a public notice as well, just letting the public know that that is um, available for inspection. And any questions? Thank you for sharing this very comprehensive budget, Mr. Testa. I, um, the question I have right now is thinking about the state funding source um, and looking at basic education funding. I know Governor Shapiro proposed a very ambitious budget for education. Are those numbers factored in here? Um, I, know, I know these things typically get passed at the last minute too. So like, how does your budgeting work around you know, our waiting to um, factor in state funding? 
So for those two additional streams that the governor had, we one, we were not getting any, and then the other stream, we were getting about 250,000. So I did factor that in. Normally, I would take a more conservative approach. If we were a district where we would get two and a half million dollars, I would definitely caution the board on putting that full 250 million in. But since this was such a small amount, we went ahead and did that. Um, in his proposal, he's offering districts the uh, what the funding that they're getting this year and then added those two sources. But they were so small for our district that um, it was not a large impact to put it all in. Okay, so that'd be something relatively easy if that were not to go yes. through the way intent. Okay. Right, and even on the special education side, I think it was $35,000. So again, it was minimal for our district. Okay, thank you. Um, you are proposing a 4% tax increase, which I know is under the Act 1 index, but um, you know, given the tax prices are high everywhere, people are having monetary issues. I'm just interested, is there things that the district wanted that weren't included in this budget that they took out due to cost concerns? So we, all, we did ask the, uh, the different budget managers of the departments to kind of bring forward what you know, the request for us. And the, there were some staffing issue, staffing requests that we could not include. So that's why the ones that we did show were really the ones that, okay, if this ultimately you had to put something in, you know, what was the one item that you would want to put in? But there were other items that, you know, we were, did not include. Thank you. I had a question on the instructional expense for ADM. Is that, was that an inflation adjusted graph or no? So the actual instructional expense is calculated by PDE on an annual basis. Oh. So based on the um, annual financial report that each school district in Pennsylvania submits, they take that information and calculate the actual instructional expense. Okay. So for the budget year, I utilize their formula with our numbers to put in there. So that number is not certified yet, but the prior numbers are certified. Right. Okay, thank you. Sure. So there is a, a lot of information that was quickly presented in this um, overview of the budget. Um, $150 million is a uh, considerable budget for the district to manage. I think it is, um, it was helpful. We didn't have this at the committee meeting, but what I would say the committee meeting also was an opportunity to get more information about the components of the budget and that we will have um, additional finance and facility committee meetings that will continue to look at the budget up until the point that it is presented for final adoption. Yes. Um, but the one thing that was added here that we didn't see at the last uh, budget presentation is the non-discretionary versus discretionary. And just to highlight that within the $150 million budget, 97% of it is items over which there are contracts and obligations mandates, regulations for us to commit those dollars uh, for those uses, all of which support the quality education in our district. But um, there is 3% of the budget, which I think goes to Ms. Vitale's question about which are things that we like might consider putting more money in or, or need to cut, but um, it's a pretty small slice of the budget over which we have uh, that kind of decision to make about what what kind of investment we're going to put in. And I think that's important to note that there are some items that are state mandated. So it's not like you can, you can bargain those items. They're, they're, they're set. Is there any impact to this budget um, based on ESSER funds going away? Uh, we have not included ESSER funds in this. So if there's any carryover from our current programs, that'll be added in, but it would be a net zero impact to the budget. just say again what are the next steps for the budget then i know i i really do appreciate the timeline and seeing what's required by the state but for you and for looking at the budget and for the board what are what are we doing next okay so the next step so on may 2nd at that meeting you will adopt the proposed final budget so this is not the final at that point this is really just PDE's guidance that you know, in following the Act 1 timeline that we have to put something in place to say here's kind of where we're working from um, before we do the final budget. Um, then the budget will be made available to the public so they can view it. And then June 3rd, we will post the 
intend to adopt the final budget and at your June 13th meeting you'll adopt the final budget but in that May finance and uh, facilities committee meeting we can also do another um, discussion on the budget and where we have come from today to that point before we do the final adoption I was thinking it's only the second presentation it can't be the end yet no, right no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right We're, we'll hear from you a couple yes. more times this school year I think. absolutely okay thanks and for members of the community who are, are watching and interested in the budget being available in what format is that is that something that would be on our website or available here in the administration office so it'll be on the website and it'll be available here in the administration building it'll be a PDF report um, basically in the format that PD, uh, PDE requires for submission Any other comments or discussion? Thank you for the budget presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And as the board continues to look at that information, we invite you know questions, email uh, Tony with questions. It was questions that were raised at the last committee meeting that went into uh, g generating this presentation for this evening. Um, so the same could happen at the committee meeting as well. Um, just a, a few um, announcements before we before we move on. Um, one item on our agenda this evening is a donation um, listed as a donation from Giant. Uh, act and actually the way in which that is compiled is people in this community who shop at Giant who, you know, when they're asking to round the dollars up. Mm -hmm. uh, so while the donations identified as coming from Giant, uh, it really has originated from uh, members within the, in the community. So we thank uh, the members in the community for making the choice uh, to round up. Uh, this past Tuesday, the district hosted the first of two family brain nights. Uh, these focus on brain science research and how it can help children learn at school and at home. The next session is actually going to be a virtual one. Um, the one held this week was in person, uh, Wednesday, 24, the, April 24th uh, at seven o'clock via Zoom. Um, so there's information on our website if anybody wants to sign up for that. We look forward to seeing lots of people next week at the uh, Twilight 5K Run and Walk, uh, sponsored by the Education Foundation. Uh, you just heard about the great work um, of the Education Foundation with the staff at, at Chestnut Walt. Uh, that 5K is next Saturday, the 27th, um, right outside of Haverford High School. Um, and uh, dance the night away at the Haverford Middle School, the social for um, older adults. You heard Naomi mention it early, uh, earlier this evening. Uh, and when she said for seniors, that's it's for senior citizens, <laughs> uh, not seniors at, um, at our high school. It really is a, a great event. Um, and it was exciting to hear her say, you know, that the kids are going to be involved in that as well. So that's it for this evening. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next section of our agenda is time for public comment, and we did have somebody sign up. Uh, the board values public comment as an essential component of school governance that adds information for the deliberation of the important and complex matters that come before the board. It is an opportunity for members of the community to address the board, and our board meetings are an opportunity for us all to model good government and engaged citizenship for our students. Our public comment is divided into two sections. This First section is for comments pertaining to action items on tonight's agenda. The agenda is published on our school district website in the school board section under board docs. There's a later time for public comment and other school related matters. Residents of the township may in advance of the meeting sign up to make public comment by emailing public comment at haverfordsd.net in order to give everyone an equal opportunity to speak and per our board policy, you will have three minutes to address the board at the three minute point, a timer will sound and you will be asked to conclude your remarks. Please begin your comments by stating your name and confirming your residency in Haverford Township. If you have meeting, if you have materials to distribute, please leave them at the end of the board table. Your name and the topic of your comments will be recorded in the meeting minutes and your presentation is being broadcast and recorded. If appropriate, an administrator or I will follow up with speakers to discuss or respond to issues raised. With that, we had Christopher Kibby Shelton. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, hi, my name is Christopher Shelton. I'm a resident of the township. I currently attend uh, 
Yeah. I currently attend Westchester University for biology secondary education. I'm here to talk to you about the resolution of the school voucher program, which we you will be voting on tonight. Voucher programs pose a direct threat to the equitable funding and accessibility of our public education by diverting taxpayer money to private schools through vouchers. Uh, schools through vouchers, we risk undermining the resources available to our public schools, which serve all students regardless of the background or ability. These private schools also have no obligation to be as open or as transparent as, transparent as the public school system, nor do they have to follow the rigor, rigorous testing standards mandated by the Commonwealth. I urge you to consider the long-term implications of supporting the, the school voucher program our public education system is a cornerstone of our community, serving all students with transparency, accountability, and inclusivity. Investing in our public schools is the key to addressing any shortcomings and ensuring that every child receives the quality education they deserve. I hope that the board tonight votes against the vouchers as they're a direct threat to public education. That was really choppy, I'm sorry. Anyway, thank you, that, that's it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Yes. Good evening. My name is Helene Comrie Smith. I'm a resident here in the township. Um, I did watch the committee meeting um, for finance, and um, I know that you're going to be voting to renew a contract with the auditor. Um, that you hired and I'm just I'm, I'm not sure like I didn't know that you're a government body but in the business world um, they take things very seriously um, it's concerning that the school district is once again requesting to hire the same auditor when in the past two years the utilization of the teacher prescription plan was under budgeted therefore there's a need for a 6.8 percent increase and in for the prescription program I have heard many times the budget is just right. People are sharpening their pencils and erasing and reevaluating. However, where was this reevaluation? It took two years to discover this. Um, what budget coffer did the money come from to pay for this uh, prescription program for the past two years? So I, I do would like a follow up for that because th there's a tendency not to follow up. So I'm going to ask you to follow up and I'll follow up with an email after this. And if I need to, I will file the right to know. Thank you. I don't want to do that, but I will. Any other public comment? We'll move on to board reports for the Delaware County Community College. Sorry. So the um, Delaware County Community College will have a budget presentation uh, next Wednesday. There's also uh, interviews for the open position for the Board of Trustees that will be um, taking place in early May to fill the open vacancy. That's it. Thank you. The Delaware County Intermediate Unit. Yeah, so the DCIU board committee meetings took place on Wednesday, April 10th. Um, during those meetings, we heard from facilities. Um, we were looking at a, an RFP for renovation to the lobby at the Morton campus. For the education committee, we had a presentation on structured literacy and how DCIU is supporting districts in meeting the new mandate around structured, structured literacy instruction. Um, we also had a presentation on personnel and we learned about the success of the referral bonuses program in hiring high quality candidates, improving the culture um, at DCIU and also um, retaining, retaining those hires, which aligns very well to the research on the topic. So it's, it's good to see research meeting reality um, with referral bonuses. We actually had this committee meeting or these committee meetings at the DCIU Aston Education Center, which was fabulous. It's a huge campus if you haven't been there or seen it. Um, we did have an opportunity to tour the facilities afterward and it's incredible all the different schools that are there. Um, some of the classrooms we had a chance to look at were Head Start and Early Intervention. Um, we saw Pre-K Counts. We saw multiple CTE classrooms. We went into Culinary Arts, Welding, Construction, um, for, and also the forward bound program for um, high school students or secondary students with extremely complex um, social emotional needs, IEPs, um, who have not experienced success in other educational settings. So um, some of the 
the students with the greatest needs being served. So it was just amazing to see the, the range of, of needs that DCIU meets at the Aston campus. Um, and then our next committee meeting will be on Wednesday, May 8th, and that's it. Thank you. Legislative Council. Um, yes, so a couple of things. Um, first is just a reminder for the board members that um, the morning of May 17th is a, the legislative breakfast. Um, a flyer will be coming out to, to all of you um, to be able to just remind you to RSVP um, if you plan to attend. Um, at the meeting, we had information shared um, in regards to the Senate Education Committee public hearing that happened on April 4th, in particular on later start school start times for secondary education. Um, there were medical doctors as well as Radnor School District presented at that public hearing. Um, there is bipartisan movement um, building in support of this um, statewide mandate. Um, there is a current bill um, moving its way through the House. Um, so it is a bill that is one for us to watch. Um, it would have the goal for statewide start times to be later for secondary education starting in the year 2026, 2027 school year. Um, at this moment in time, it remains an unfunded mandate. Um, so that was just something to be to watching for. Um, two other bills were, were there were many bills to discuss, but two to highlight um, is House Bill 1553, um, which has passed the House, it's moving to the Senate, um, and it is around suicide hotline. One of the particular things that it would require is for all public schools um, for grades 6 to 12, that they would print um, a hotline phone number that is a 24-7 hotline phone number on all student ID cards. Um, so something for us to consider, maybe even something that we may do before, because um, it seems a, a good idea. Um, House Bill 1875 um, is about a AP exam cost reduction. Um, if this, this did pass pretty strongly with 144 to 57 in the House, um, so we'll see if it passes the Senate as well, um, it would have the state cover 80% of the cost of AP exam. Um, I personally wrote a check for quite a few AP exams um, this year, so that is a significant cost to families. Um, so we'll see um, what the state state does with that. Um, we are entering into the, the time when the PSBA legislative platform process starts, so to be considering if there are things that board members would like to propose. And yeah, that's some of what we talked about. All right, thank you for that. And um, it is not a specific, Report, but Dr. McKay, I know you are also on the wellness committee. Would you be prepared to do that as well? Yeah, um, I, it was a quick meeting. Um, also, because we, I think we will have, I will kind of hold off on a lot of the report just because um, come May 16th, we're going to have an official board report from the wellness committee. Um, but a couple of things that were discussed, um, the elementary schools are pretty excited for track to have started. That's a big deal in our elementary schools. Um, and the big meet will be May 22nd. Um, Bringing Hope home, I know we've had our middle school reporters um, let us know about this, but this year they raised over $100,000 for community members. Um, and one of the big things was just outdoor recess now due to better weather is bringing a whole lot of joy and wellness to folks. Um, again, the meeting was filled with lots of information, but I, I think we'll have more of an official report come that May. All right, we'll look forward to that, but thank you for answering all that on the spot. Uh, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association. Thanks. Um, last Monday, uh, April 8th, I was able to attend the Day on the Hill Legislative um, Advocacy Day for, uh, for, for PSBA. Saw our old board member, Larry Feinberg, there. He said that he would love to come back to these meetings on Thursday, except he's sitting in front of his fireplace drinking bourbon. <laughs> his words exactly, by the way. So uh, he, won't, he won't be back. But we did. We were able to go and talk to a few, to, to a few senators. Um, Greg Vitale, who is our state rep, was not there, but um, he, he, he had a business. But we were able to speak to Amanda Capaletti and uh, the minority chair of the Education Committee, Lindsay Williams. The main topic that we're discussing is House Bill 1422. It's a bill that passed uh, bipartisan and it was, was a very strong bipartisan support earlier this year. It's a cyber charter reform bill. It would do many things, uh, among them cap the cyber charter tuition. Um, right now, cyber charter tuition for um, students in the Commonwealth it's very, it's it's pretty high. I think our cost per student is around fifteen thousand. Cyber charters who have no hard costs, many of them are close to or above that amount. So this would cap the amount, the amount that they're able to charge for tuition at eight thousand dollars. 
would save every school district in the Commonwealth some significant money. I believe we would save a couple hundred thousand dollars, actually, for Everford. Um, but both senators who we spoke to indicated a willingness to support that bill. Whether or not it, it, it comes up is is questionable. It's not, it, it, would, it would pass. It's also somewhat in question. Um, they said that some elements might be able to pass through a, a um, school code bill, which they must pass bill each year. I guess we'll keep an eye on that and um, see where that goes. But that's a significant piece of, of, of legislation. Uh, and then, as uh, Dr. McKay mentioned, this also is, is, is an opening time for PSBA platform proposals. Um, I was speaking to a couple school districts uh, last year. We, um, we submitted a, a platform proposal for safety reforms. Want to look to do something similar um, this year. More to come on that. We have until the end of June to put forth those, um, th those items. So we have a good amount of time to think about that, but something to, 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 to consider. If anybody has any questions, feel free to um, grab me and ask me. All right, thank you. The Finance and Facilities Committee meeting. And I'll keep on talking. Um, so, uh, a couple of things to talk about here. One of them is um, our, our ongoing school construction for Chatham Park, or, or, or I guess I should say renovations for Chatham Park and the middle school. There is a uh, state, state requirement called an Act 34 hearing. For any major renovations, um, we are required to hold a, an, Act, an Act 34 hearing. Uh, obviously, we are always we always welcome public comment on these um, uh, on these very large um, expenditures. An Act 34 hearing is something that is official, something that is required by the state. Uh, I'll read you some dates, and I apologize. I'm be looking at my computer because a couple of those dates changed. And I want to make sure that I that I quote them properly. Um, one of the um, there will be a booklet prepared for this, and that will be that that will be presented on May 9th at the Finance and Facility. Um, committee meeting that day that will be the that they will have the construction documents the final prices those kinds of um of, of, of items that is scheduled to be approved by the board or, or voted on by the board on may 16th and then i believe on june 13th i want to say that date change june june 13th at the regular meeting we will be um before that that meeting there will be an act 34 hearing and that is going to be a presentation to the public of all of the Act 34 information, the costs, the construction documents, all of those things. And it's an opportunity for, or another opportunity, I should say, for the public to comment on the school renovations. Um, I was going to talk about also the um, proposed budget, but I think Mr. T Mr. T um, Testa did a very, very good job at that. Um, just to reiterate, though, the Act, for, the, the Act 1 index for this year, the maximum amount that, that we are allowed to raise taxes based on the index is 5.3%. For the past several years, we've come in below that, and this year is no exception. We're, we're at about 4%. And looking at the other neighboring school districts, we're about in the middle. Some raised it by a bit more than that. Some raised it by, by, by a bit less. So we're right kind of in that middle ground for, um, for, for our, our, our region on the tax increase. Can I just interject that those are um, all proposed at this point? I They're all proposed. I can't imagine any of the yes. districts have actually enacted that, mm -hmm. so just that caveat. No, that's a good, I, 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 that's a good point. I appreciate it. We're, we're all, ours is also right now proposed. So everything is proposed until it gets finalized in June. A couple of other informational items. Um, we are being we are going to be asked to 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 renew the uh, audit services with um, BBD this evening. Um, we went through the um, March 2023 2024 um, revenues and expense report at the meeting. There is a um, we we ask also to 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 approve uh, bids for for a new phone system. I believe it's Ring Central. Um, and then we are we we are also going going to be asked. To excuse me here, we're going to be asked to approve the um, bid solicitation for um, for the school renovations at uh, Chatham Park and the and the middle school. Um, finally, there was a there was a um, informational item. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm sorry. Also, we're being we're being asked to 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 approve um, owners rep. Services from uh, CB Development. We've been using them for for many years now. For our arms rep for Linwood for, for the high school for all of our major construction projects. So we'll be so we'll be asked to to approve a contract with them. 
And then finally, there's an informational item that was, that, that, that was discussed at, at the meeting for the property tax rent rebate program. That's a program um, that is partially funded by, by the state, partially funded by school districts that would provide tax, uh, provide property tax relief for individuals who meet certain in income thresholds. Um, in, our, in the county, there is currently one other district that does that, I believe it's Radnor. Uh, region-wide, there are several who, who, who have this program as well. We, um, we, had, we had some information presented, or, or we, we, have re we requested some information uh, about some of the um, financial implications of, of um, incorporating that program into our budget. So more information to come on that. And um, basically it for finance and facilities. Thank you. And I'll just add that that property tax rebate is a program that is currently running through the state and members of our community who meet those eligibility requirements may apply for the state funded rebate uh, through, I think, June, I believe it is. Through, yeah. Okay. There's information on our website. There's information on our website and I know um, Local state rep uh, Greg Vitale has also um, had information about that available. What did I say, Greg Vitale? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah, this would be a match program where we would match a certain percentage of uh, of the, uh, of those rebates. So. All right. Looking forward to more about that. People services. All right. So, following the finance committee meeting, the curriculum committee meeting took place. Um, we heard about three different three, three different presentations, excuse me. The first being the world language proposal at the middle school, um, specifically Prima, Prima Lingua. And this is a prep course that's designed for students to um, really just strengthen their skills and confidence as they're beginning to take their first full year of language. Um, the idea for this program is to help students be more successful once they're taking their language at the high school. Um, again, just helping them to feel comfortable and confident and be positioned better to be more successful with their full language program there. We also heard um, or received a presentation rather regarding the life skills support program review committee update. Um, this program is based on the student needs as a complex learner and it really individualized to ensure that the student needs are being met within um, in their schooling to be successful. There was a CCIU um, Chester County Intermediate Unit audit follow-up. Um, there has been some recommendations that have already been addressed and some that is currently being addressed by the committee. Um, the next steps would be to determine the training that, that may be needed and then a final selection on adaptive functioning program. Finally, we had a presentation related to the gifted program and the main takeaways there were to look at how to revise the current screener in order to identify a more diverse population of students. Um, there were two screener recommendations that were discussed um, and, and changes related to the screening and the identification processes was, was the highlight there. Looking at student work samples, classroom diagnostic tools, ensuring that teachers and staff also have the supports needed and training in place to be able to identify students to be recommended for that program all under, under the lens of trying to identify a more diverse student population for the gifted program. So next steps will include a review of all recommendations. Um, the committee work will continue and there'll be a, the next curriculum meeting will be on May 9th. That is all. Thank you. The policy committee. Just to say that our next committee meeting is next Thursday at 6.30. And for the board president's report, um, this is a busy time of year as we heard from our students and one of the initiatives that the board has is to get out and to uh, partake of more of the activities and offerings around the district at uh, our schools and see a variety of things and, and to that end, uh, building principals submit uh, activities that are, are going on and invite board members to attend. And um, I was able to go to a assembly that was at Chatham Park Elementary for a um, multicultural uh, celebration. And there was a uh, captivating presenter. I'm forgetting her name is Tanika, Takira. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, Ms. Carter was there too. And um, 
She was a storyteller and a musician and had the kids captivated and participating with uh, lots of positive messages. I think it, um, the vibe in the room would rival uh, some of the cheering that we heard goes on at Chestnut Wall that day. Uh, so it was, it was great to see that. And then um, I was able to attend the brain night uh, that uh, was hosted at the middle school the other night and learn some things. Um, Apparently, there is no such thing as multitasking, which is a disappointment to me, but uh, she talked about instead your task switching. That's all you can focus on, just one thing at a time. So a little takeaway, and so I do recommend the Zoom uh, opportunity that's coming up. Uh, she will present an entirely different set of information. Um, the presenter is a Haverford grad, um, so that was nice to have that connection. But. Um, it's, it was nice to see all the different ways that the district is supporting families and students and, and making opportunities like that available. Uh, did any other board members attend events or activities representing the board? We'll get more next time, and especially as the busy end of year uh, comes and with all the celebrations for that. The next section of our agenda is for finance and facilities matters, and item A is the bill list. I will welcome a motion to approve disbursements for payments totaling $1,408,364.79. So moved. First and second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Item B is charitable donation. I will welcome a motion to accept the donation from Giant Food Stores in the amount of $18,608.03 as part of their Feeding Schools, Feeding School Kids initiative. Larson moved. Okay, second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Thanks to the community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, want to second that. Thanks to the community. and. When we receive these funds, and there's stipulations on how they need to be used, I guess it's feeding school kids. So what are the uses of these funds? So uh, these funds will work through our social workers. Uh, sometimes there will be you know, gift cards to giant that will be purchased with them, but they're used to feed families. Great. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item C is owner's representation services proposal. I will accept a motion to approve the owner's representation services proposal with CDB Development Inc. for the construction phase of the middle school cafeteria addition project and Chatham Park Elementary School renovation and additions project. So it's moved. Shelton second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Looking forward to working with, uh, with, with the CBD. They, we, they, they have gone through uh, with us on, on Linwood and high school expansions. And thus far, all the projects have come in under budget and on time. So I, you know, they've, they, they've done a very good job. And thanks to them. And let's keep it going for Chatham and the middle school. Yeah, they've worked with the district. I don't even know how many, how many years, but they started when the district was working on the high school project. Okay, so decades. So they wow. intimately know our facilities and the team um, within the district. And as updates are always very comprehensive. I mean, I, yeah, very, very, very excited to, to book them again. And for those of us who don't work in the finance facilities world, it is nice to have Ken come in and explain things to us <laughs> um, at our level, at an accessible level. Um, so I couldn't agree more. I've had a really good experience my time on the board working with CBD and happy to see their uh, proposal come in for Chatham in the middle school. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The next item is D for BBD LLC local audit renewal. I will accept a motion to approve the agreement between the School District of Haverford Township and BBD LLC to perform the annual local audits for the years 2024 to 2025, 2025 to 2026, and 2026 to 2027. Where it's moved. First and second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I will ask a, a question uh, to Mr. Testa uh, following the public comment that we had. There was. Um, a question about the auditor's role in preparing our our budget. Can you speak to what 
uh, role or influence, if any, they have in the preparation of the budget that you presented. So the auditors don't have any um, involvement in preparing the budget. They just look at the year-end numbers and making sure everything complies with state reporting on the actual side. Any other comments or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item E is for bid solicitation. I will accept a motion to solicit bids for the Chatham Park Elementary School renovation and additions project and the add alternate for the middle school cafeteria additions project. Okay, moved. Vitaly, second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Real. <laughs> You just remind me how how do we go about soliciting bids is that also mr mm -hmm. testa's purview yep so that will be advertised in the daily times and the inquirer um, it'll be it'll go out for three consecutive weeks and then the bids will be collected here and then they'll be open publicly for the contractors to look at okay thank you and could you just describe a little bit of what that process entails there are certain requirements that school districts have for bidding projects that may not be familiar to what people think of like kitchen renovation or a home addition sure. at their own house. So within that bid, um, we will ask for a bid bond to make sure that, you know, if they do accept, if we do award to them and they accept it, that they don't back out of the work and, you know, cause us more time and money to have to then do another bid. Um, there would be a non-collusion affidavit that's in there as well. Um, any kind of insurance requirements that we have would be in there as well. And it, it has to be a legitimate bid, like they have to be bidding on the requirements that we're looking for. So we have to go through and just make sure that what we've asked for is what they've presented. So we're comparing apples to apples across all the bids. And we need to get bids from four primes? Yes, from four primes. And there will be um, site visits where they will come out so they know exactly what they're bidding on before they make that final commitment to the district. Is our um, requirement for the lowest reasonable bidder? Is yes, that? lowest responsible bidder. Lowest responsible bidder, okay. I have a question. Has district considered um, using some of the platforms like uh, like PinBid, for example, to get a larger number of... Uh... I don't know that they have in this case. I think they're just using the two publications. And we tend to get enough bids for, through those publications. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion about going to bid? So, um, and this has been discussed in the Facilities and Finance Committee meeting, but the bids are being packaged with Chatham Park as like the main project. And because of the smaller scale of the middle school cafeteria, there was concern that it on its own wouldn't generate sufficient interest to um, get competitive bids. So by putting it as an odd alternate to the Chatham bid, uh, we should get contractors interested in that larger scope of work and ideally more favorable pricing yes, for, competitive. for that relatively small addition to the scope. Yes. Great. Uh, so all in favor of going to solicit bids? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item F is a tax assessment appeals resolutions. I will accept a motion to approve the settlement and stipulation of counsel in tax assessment appeals pending in the Court of Common Pleas of Delaware County and authorize counsel and proper officers of the board to execute necessary documents. Vitaly moved. Larson second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item G is Ring Central Professional Services. I will accept a motion to award a five year agreement with Ring Central for district phone services with an annual recurring cost of $91,997.04 starting August 1, 2024, pending solicitor review. Vitaly moved. Or second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? This was discussed at the finance facilities meeting, correct? Yep. Yes. 
Yes, it was. Yeah. And 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 just a quick emendation. I believe that Ring Central is, use, is being used for the majority of our services. We we are still using Zoom for meetings. And yeah, there was a process that was described where there was a panel of staff mm -hmm. who tested out different systems and ranked and rated them on both usability and then a primary driver was the affordability and, and cost of, of this phone service replacement. And those ratings and, 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 and a, bit, a little narrative on that is in the finance facility, what, what, um, report on that is in the finance facilities um, info on board docs, for anybody who wants to check it out. All right, all in favor of the five-year agreement with Ring Central. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The final item under finance matters tonight is equipment purchase. I will accept a motion to authorize the use of committed fund balance in the amount of $113,915 for equipment related to the new phone system. Okay, moved. Chilton second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We're now in the human resources section of our agenda. Item A is appointments. I will accept a motion to approve the following appointments as listed below, contingent upon receipt of all necessary clearances, including Act 168 of 2014. Person moved. Shelton second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Are we fully staffed now for ESY? No. Okay. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Appointments are approved. Item B is for leave of absence. I'll accept a motion to approve the following leave requests. Person moved. Snodgrass second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is approved. <coughs> Item C is for retirements and resignations. I will welcome a motion to accept the following retirements and resignations as listed. Okay, moved. Larson second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? There's just a lot of long-term employees <laughs> retiring. 42 <laughs> years, 26 Two years. years. So just thank you for your service. I think 42 uh, years may be a new record. Yeah. Our June 13th meeting will recognize all of the retirees. Mm, great. 42 years, all with, yeah. was it all in the transportation department? All with uh, yes. being a bus driver? That's incredible. He has to come with stories <laughs> about the lots of stories. <laughs> yes, I don't know, probably. <laughs> I think forty-two years is 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 one of the highest ones that, that I've seen since since sitting up here. That's that's that's, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's great. On the list is also Karen Ramplin in our food <laughs> services, twenty-six years. Um, Helen Fitzpatrick, an instructional assistant at the high school for eighteen years. And then Jean Marie Owls, a middle school language teacher for 23 years. Almost 100 years combined. Right. <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes with our well wishes. Item eight is for pupil services. Uh, we will begin with item A is the special education plan for 2024 to 2027. I will accept a motion to approve the 2024 through 2027 special education plan. Larson moved. Snodgrass second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how members of the steering committee were chosen. I looked back at my, my March notes from the curriculum committee and I couldn't find where that was determined. I can, um, while uh, Nicole Battistelli comes to the microphone, I can say that they, they weren't chosen or selected. Sure. So um, we had volunteers for district employees, so teachers and personnel that work in the district. We sent an email to parents and had volunteers for parents, and then we used a Google number generator to select parents, um, five parents, 
randomly representing each level. And then the members of the board were all invited to provide feedback and the members of the board who were present at the committee meeting who provided feedback were included as part of the steering committee because that was the opportunity to provide feedback as well as what it was said uh, during the weekly update. So I bring that up because I know that one of the things that was I had in my notes for that meeting was ensuring that we are broadening communication um, to parents of special education students. And so I just want to make sure that we're doing that at every chance that we get. Yes, yeah, so they I, I, I certainly recognize that um, special education parents and families may at times experience some sort of a disconnect from the district due to that their child may not be placed in an actual district school or may not have the same sort of school day. And so I just want to ensure that every chance we get, we are communicating, overly communicating, how parents have an opportunity and members of the board have an opportunity to be a part of committees such as these. Yes, so an email went out to all parents identified in power schools had a good student with an IEP. Initially, it seemed like it didn't go to all out-of-district parents, and so we sent another email to make sure it went to all out-of-district parents, and then we brought another volunteer in based on the group that volunteered from that group. In addition, from the discussions with the parents during our um, committee meeting, one of the parents suggested a quarterly, like a newsletter from special education because what they just said to me, they'll read an email if I send it, but they don't read all the emails that come from the district. So I sent the special ed plan in the newsletter with a link to the email address to provide comments on the special ed plan so that everyone had another opportunity to provide feedback. Thank you for explaining that. Sure. I was just saying in future, if we could just capture that somewhere, perhaps in the presentation, and that way it's helpful for everyone just to know and be aware. Sure. Thank you. And I'm um, wondering too if we could, um, maybe include robo-texts as another way to, or robo-calls just as another means of communicating if that hasn't already been done with families to let them know about In addition to the email. Yeah. Sure. Um, I just had one quick question. Um, I, I understand that um, the, the board members that ended up on this list was because we were at the committee meeting. Cool. Um, however, I'm curious, all the other folks who are on this list, um, what was involved in being part of the steering committee? Like how many times did they meet? What kind of opportunities for, for input? So there was meetings that depended on how far we got through the special ed plan. It is a very lengthy um, plan. So for some groups like the teachers, we had two or three meetings to get through. We just had to stop based on time allocated during the school day. We didn't have enough time. Like parents, we did a night, two night meetings, but I was trying, I didn't want to keep them too long, but they all were very comfortable staying over the hour that we had allotted. So we had two meetings, but it was over a few hours between those two meetings. Um, so it was just um, what we needed to get through the full plan, depending on the group and the time allotted was the number of meetings. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Okay. So I think the, the name steering committee might have just confused people because it seems like when you have a steering committee, everybody meets all at once. But in the way that this was done, it was sort of... Um, ad hoc, right? And so it was like people so it's, at different times. Yes, everyone, ha you know, trying to give everybody the opportunity to provide feedback. A lot of the plan is very structured by PDE. So there's not a lot of like creativity that gets to go into the plan. Um, so we had to schedule things around like professional schedules, parent schedules, and who was available. Yeah, I appreciate it. It yeah. seems like it was a lot more than just having one meeting. And oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, many, 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 um, many meetings. So thanks for the additional yeah, detail. Sure. Any other comments or discussion or perspectives on the special education plan? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The plan is approved. Item B is for out of district educational services contract. I accept a motion to approve the following educational agreements for students attending out of district placement as listed. Person moved. Shelton second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. In section nine of the agenda for curriculum and instruction, we have item A is student <coughs> educational excursions. I will accept a motion to approve the student educational excursion listed below. Person moved. Okay, second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I just want to say I'm so grateful that this is back again. Um, my middle son did goal team last year at the middle school. I think it was the greatest um, experience of his middle school year. I think it was the first year back post COVID and um, those 
three days and two nights he still talks about and um, it was just so much fun. So I'm excited for the kids who are going and grateful that the district is continuing this tradition. speak to what is gold team i know it from my middle schoolers experience but i see mr haran here <laughs> could you <Yeah. laughs> take your time nervous yeah, don't. <laughs> so the gold team is a group of eighth grade students uh they commit to the gold team at the beginning of the year Every student is welcomed over the first three quarters of the school year. The students are working on some community service projects, some, some commitments for academics. They have commitments for their own physical health. They meet on a monthly basis and support each other. And ultimately after that third quarter, it's kind of like you're anointed, you're on the goal team, but they, they have work to do within the school and in the community. Uh, to show their citizenship and being a good student, um, roughly 120 to 140 students usually are committed to the goal team every year. And it's just a, a really fun, collaborative opportunity for all of our kids. Can anybody join it? What's that? And they can, just like, well, I mean, any eighth grader who wants to do it can do it. It's not like selection. Correct. Right? Okay. It's, it's kind of changed over the last was, few yeah. years. Oh, no. I would love to join it. <laughs> Sounds riveting. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, evolved over the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. Three, three uh, staff members run Gold Team. So it's uh, Mr. Brocklesby, Mr. Huth, and Mrs. Collins. Uh, three of our teachers are the sponsors. But ultimately, a lot of the work they do over the course of the school year is so they can attend this this uh, culminating activity, uh, this three year three day uh, camping trip. It's usually the highlight of their experience. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you for explaining Gold Team because I didn't even quite understand. My parents would ask me, "What is it he's doing?" And I'm like, "It's a physical fitness, fun, service, academic thing." Like, and I just didn't really. It's a little bit of everything. So thank you yeah, for describing that. But the culmination is, I mean, that trip is the pinnacle of, yeah. and so much, just so much, like just good, like kind of old school fun. It just, really is, yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the staff, uh, not only those three staff members who um, run the gold team, we always, we have a few other staff members that join in just to help with the supervision. And it's honestly, it's the highlight of their year as well, the, uh, the staff that attend. Your staff will be busy. We heard from the middle school I reporters know, about Canadensis, Hershey <laughs> Park, Dorney, Dorney, yeah, Camp Quebec. So yeah, there's a, a lot of a lot good going stuff on at the end of the year. Thank you for your impromptu sure. presentation. <laughs> All right, so we um, we heard about Gold Team, and the motion is to approve the student educational excursion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. In section 11 of our agenda. Uh, there is an item for the 2024-25 school board schedule of meetings. I will accept a motion to approve the school board schedule of meetings for the 2024-25 school year. Person moved. Sagra, second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? The meetings just keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only change that's noticeable is the December. Um, instead of having three meetings, that month, one of which is usually a five minute meeting <laughs> for um, our appointments, we're gonna have two meetings that month, right? For the reorganization Right, combining meeting. the reorganization meeting, which sits um, by state law of um, the first Monday in December to, um, and then we would usually have a regular board meeting the Thursday of that week um, to try to combine more. those and yes. get um, more business done under one meeting umbrella. And uh, there is, usually a first and third cadence to the meetings. Um, July the, um, is the first month on this calendar and that will have just one meeting in the summer. PCIU doesn't have any meeting in, this, in July. Yeah. <laughs> out there, if we can make that <laughs> one Keep work. the lights on. <laughs> all right, all in favor of the school board schedule? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Item B is a resolution urging equitable funding accountability. I will accept a motion to approve the resolution urging equitable funding accountability in Pennsylvania public education. Okay, moved. First and second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Um, I'll start. I've already voiced my objections to this resolution. I think last month when it first came up, um, I generally think resolutions like this, even when I agree with them, which I don't with this one, but I think they're kind of worthless. And I think they're just kind of done to, for people to pat themselves on the back. Um, but this resolution I find very um, entitled and privileged. I think for the Haverford School Board to tell a parent of a child in a struggling school district what they should do with their child is, is honestly cringy. Um, public education has many shortcomings and we need to make improvements, absolutely. But these will take time and parents of children in struggling districts do not have time. And so I think it's beyond entitled for us to tell these parents to think of the big picture, stay the course. But beyond this, my two other concerns, if I honestly think this is a big waste of our time to have this on the board's agenda again, when we could be focusing on issues directly affecting our students, like overuse of technology at the elementary level. Um, but, and personally, my second concern, I think one of the biggest issues um, in and threats to our country right now is like the rise of extremism, both left and right. And I see extremism in the creation of, and adoption of this proposal. Um, here we have a moderate proposal by a moderate governor, a moderate democratic governor. And the moment a step is made to compromise the other, the other side, you know, with the other side, extremism comes into play and people get up in arms. So this proposal, there's no need to belabor this. It's gonna pass seven to one, but I just wanna make it clear that I didn't want any part of this. Thank you. I will add that um, in Philadelphia, there is support to oppose this, similar to what Haverford is recommending here. And if you look at the numbers in terms of schools where students would qualify because they're quote underperforming, Philadelphia would be um, a big piece of that pie. Um, and they're opposing this because the, the desire is to see more money put into public education and to strengthen our schools. Um, so I think that privilege argument falls short because even the schools where students, the districts where students would qualify for this, um, unions are backing the opposition to this, to this, um, to pass. Yeah, um, and also I believe Coatesville, which is another district local to here where there are, um, quote, underperforming schools, which to clarify is just based on PSSA scores alone. Um, they are working toward passing this resolution as well. Just to add to that, in many school districts, there are many, there are many districts who have passed resolutions very similar to this. And this is really taking money away from public schools and it's giving it to students who, in many cases, are neither low income or, or who are not low income and who are not from low achieving districts. They can be used by um, students who, 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 you know, have the means for private, for, for private education. So I, I'm very much in favor of, of this resolution. I think it's important that we voice our opinion to the, um, to, to our elected officials. And something that has not been, um, clarified around the, the Senate bill is there is a pot of a hundred million dollars that the state is going to set aside to fund this. Um, when Dr. McKay and I met with Ms. Lee, Ms. Lee in our ad hoc committee, we did the numbers. This would not even begin to cover all of the students who qualify under the definition of underperforming school district and low income. Um, so in that way, this isn't even an equitable solution. But my other question as a taxpayer in, this, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is where is that $100 million coming from? I think it has been raised by members of this board and um, we've gotten comment from members of the community about why Haverford School District School Board would pass this resolution or any resolution. And I think uh, Mr. Schwartz touched on that, right? Like this is our opportunity to make the effect of a public comment. So this is our opportunity to, as a board, put a position statement, a value statement out there and um, regarding the question of whether this is in the board's purview or you know function, um, we are representing the best interests of a public school system, a public school district. And if there's questions like whether this is enough to be outraged enough to make a, a statement, make a resolution against it, um, my question is, 
you know, why would we tolerate any diversion of funds from public education? Um, and then when you talk about $100 million that is not being channeled to the public school system that by the Commonwealth's constitution uh, is meant to support our public school system, um, I, I believe that it is the responsibility of school districts to speak out and advocate for, uh, for funding that commits the state to fulfilling its constitutional duty. Um, I think just, add, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, this is just, I wanna clarify, this is not us taking a position against private schools. That's not it at all. I think private schools are caught in the middle of this as being named as a recipient of these funds. But the fundamental issue um, that our committee took issue with is that this is completely inequitable and it is diverting funds from the public system. There's a lack of accountability. And we also don't have any research that shows that um, other programs that divert funding from public schools in this way actually lead to better student outcomes. Mm -hmm. so we're talking about transparency and accountability. This isn't it. Yeah, and I think just additionally, while the past program is part of this resolution, a key aspect of this resolution is a call to the governor and to the General Assembly to follow through with the rules that they set aside for equitable funding, which Haverford Township would benefit from. And so there is a direct reason for this call to say to the governor, to the, the General Assembly, follow your formula and fair funding for all public schools in Pennsylvania, which includes Haverford School District. Yeah, I just had, I mean, you know, there's a limited pot of money that can mm -hmm. go to public education and any voucher program is going to siphon that away and so it would directly impact our district. I mean, it, it's that simple. So it is within our purview to advocate for, you know, the equitable funding of public education. And we had a budget presentation tonight. Those um, state funding decisions have consequences for our local taxpayers and the funds that the district receives. We are largely funded by our local uh, property tax base, but 20%, I think, or so comes from the state, and um, we want to hold on to that and, and increase that for the benefit 19%. of the district and the taxpayers. I think it's 19%. I think it's 19%. <laughs> Just 18, 19%, yeah. Not for nothing, but you know, putting it out there. And I would add, too, that Haverford is not immune to this. True, we are not an underperforming, quote, school district. Um, but were we to become one, which I don't foresee, but this would be within the realm of possibility that our students would be siphoned away and that our funds would be siphoned away if circumstances were to change. So yes, we're in a position of privilege right now, but if we were to quote, become eligible because we become low performing, we would suffer the consequences. Or if vouchers were to be a more prevalent form of education funding. Absolutely. Just want to say thank you to the work done by Dr. McKay, Dr. Larson, and Miss Lee on this. Um, I really appreciate looking at it and, and thinking about Haverford when putting this together. So thanks for the, the work on that. Any other comments or discussions or points of view on the resolution before us? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes. The next section of our agenda is for public comments on other matters. And we had two people sign up. Danielle Vitale. Um, my name is Danielle Vitale. I live in the district. As a parent, I voiced my concerns multiple times about the decline in academic expectations, math skills and scores, and the lack of homework at the elementary level. If your youngest child is in eighth or ninth grade or above, you know how elementary school functioned pre-COVID and wouldn't know that any changes have occurred. If your oldest child is in elementary school, you don't know how things used to be. My older sons received a phenomenal education at Linwood, but things have unfortunately drastically changed across all five district elementary schools elementary homework, academic rigor, and parental involvement have largely disappeared post-COVID. 
Well, my youngest came to me confused with a math concept in third grade last year. I wasn't able to help him because I didn't know what he was learning. I found out that our elementary schools had math homework books that weren't allowed to come home unless you received special permission, which I did from Dr. Nesbitt. Multiple teachers across all five elementary schools told me point blank that they were not allowed to assign math homework per Dr. Nesbitt. One teacher lamented how her students needed math back practice, but she was not allowed to assign it. All of these told, teachers told me that they were um, that homework present were told that they were told that homework presented equity issues. As a district, I believe we've become more interested in political and social issues rather than academics. When my older sons were at Linwood, we were the eighth ranked school district in the state. Here's the district communication that came home with every child. Everyone was really proud. Um, and so I'm not sure why we brag about being 20 something now because that just shows we're declining. But more important than the number ranking though, our math test scores have plummeted. In 2014, as a district, we were 92% proficient or advanced in math. Linwood fifth grade by last year was 59.8% proficient or advanced in math, meaning just over 40% of our Linwood fifth graders were basic or below basic in math. At Manoa, 41.1% were proficient or advanced in math, meaning almost 60% of Manoa fifth graders were at basic or below basic levels in math. Um, people will try to say that the academic changes that have been made are best practice, but that don't. Um, but not only do educational trends come and go, this one defies logic and common sense. To get better at all things, you need to practice, and there's no reason to believe that math, math facts, reading and writing are any different than sports, music, or any life skill. While it's encouraging that the board approved a revised homework policy at the April 4th meeting, it's discouraging that we can't even allow policy language for elementary math homework up to four times a week, which is what it was pre-COVID. Um, you know, up to three times a week is the best we can do. And honestly, most Haverford elementary schools aren't even doing that. Um, this language, again, illustrates our focus, but our focus is not at on academics. Um, it's on politics and social issues rather than increasing academic rigor and increasing parental involvement. All of this flies in the face of what private, parochial, and top performing school districts like Lower Marion and Unionville Chats Board are doing. Even if you don't like me, these numbers that I shared should deeply concern you. Thank you. The next uh, person who signed up is Alexis Pasternak. Hi, good evening, Alexis Pasternak, um, board members and Dr. Rushi. Uh, almost three years ago, in a July 2021 regular meeting, a school board member made a lengthy comment to the public about critical race theory, that there's no CRT in Haverford and that it is only taught in law schools. Haverford even had a basis FAQs of frequently asked questions on their website making the same claim. In a 2021 document, which Pennsylvania edu Pennsylvania's Education Law Center and Education Voters and several other organizations signed, it was stated that critical race theory is an important part of developing culturally responsive curricula. And learning about critical race theory is also an important strategy to ensuring and cultivating a safe and welcoming school environment for all students. In the 2022 fact sheet put out by Education Law Center titled Promising Practices to Build Anti-Racist and Affirming Schools, one of the efforts they have listed in order for PA schools to make that happen is teach critical race theory. All of the links to the basis presentations and videos are still available on Haverford's website, except that one, that one link about all the, the FAQs about how, how there's no CRT. It's like it never happened, like we're supposed to pretend it never happened at all. So I just wanna say that it would be, probably be in your best interest to do the right thing um, in the interest of transparency, honesty, accuracy. Uh, this would, I think it would be wonderful if you could make a similar statement on your website where you're at with CRT. Um, thank you very much. The next regular public board meeting is scheduled to be held on May 2nd, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. in the boardroom of the Oakmont Administration Building. And with that, I will welcome a motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. Good night. Thank you, everybody.